Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. Earth, it sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because He first loved me. Good morning. I'm privileged to share a meditation on the Lord's Supper with you this morning. In Lamentations chapter 3, verses 40 and 41, Jeremiah said, Let us examine and probe our ways, and let us return to the Lord. Now, even back in the days of the Old Testament, even in the days of Jeremiah, God's people, the chosen of God, have been told to examine themselves on their pilgrim walk to heaven. The Apostle Paul mentions this taking of the inventory of the soul when discussing the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 and 28, we read, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So these Corinthians needed reminding to examine their lives. When Paul had proclaimed the gospel there, some of these Corinthians had been baptized. They became Christians. Now Paul has been gone a while, and they have set up their congregation not as the Lord's body where everyone was equal as it was originally intended, but as a type of social club. Some members were going rich and they were full. Other members of their congregation and community were going hungry. So their congregation failed to examine itself to point out these injustices. They were abusing the purpose of their fellowship gatherings, which included the Lord's Supper. So Paul is harsh, because sometimes we need a wake-up call to examine ourselves. And the only remedy is to go back and remember why our Lord died in the first place, to save us from our sins, since none of us is perfect. Without him, we have no hope. With him, we have purpose and promise, promise of eternal life and purpose for our existence here on this world. So let us look inwardly as we examine ourselves for the purpose of strengthening the church outwardly. In Paul's second letter to his Corinthian children in the faith, in chapter 13, Paul takes a more kindly tone, and he reminds them of the necessity, again, of examining themselves to take a spiritual inventory, if you will, to see their place before God. We read, For indeed Christ was crucified because of weakness, yet he lives because of the power of God. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you? Now, this verse is very similar to one that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5.21 when he said, But examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good. 
therefore, in our meditation this Lord's Day morning on the Lord's Supper, to examine ourselves means that we reach forward to that which is good. But what does the Lord himself consider to be good? Well, we're all familiar with the churches of Asia Minor that John mentions in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. And most often our lessons on that part of the Bible center on the, the admonitions that Christ gives to those seven churches of Asia Minor. He fusses at them a lot for things they're not doing right. But for many of them, not all of them, but for many of them, he prefaces his remarks with some positives, with things that he wants to, to brag on them a little bit. And so we can take a look at those and see what Jesus pinpointed as positive qualities of a congregation. And some of those good things that they had been doing, he brags about their good works, about their perseverance, about their proving what they have heard, enduring their poverty and their trials, holding fast to Christ's name in the midst of their persecution, and he really sums it up with the church at Thyatira when he says, increase in love and faith and service. So that's what they were known for. So, brothers and sisters, if we need an inventory of what the Lord himself looks for in us as we examine ourselves in our partaking of the Lord's Supper this morning, that's a pretty good list. We recall the good qualities of that church at Thyatira of increasing in love and faith and service and holding fast to our hope in him is really what we proclaim when we take the Lord's Supper. So let us do so with faith and joy and gratefulness to be one body in him through the power of the Holy Spirit as the children of God our Father. Will you bow with me now, please, as we give thanks for the bread and for the cup. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful this morning for all the blessings you give us. We're especially grateful, Father, for the sacrifice of your Son and our Savior upon the cross at Calvary. We're thankful for this bread that represents to us his body. We're thankful for the fruit of the vine that represents to us the blood that was shed on that cross so that we may have boldness as we approach you as your children. Be with us, Father, as we partake. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. May God be with you this week. Good morning, church. Hey, today's Sunday. It's May the 24th, 2020, and I want to thank you for making this online video a part of your family's stay-at-home worship this morning. Uh, we thank you for joining us. Hey, it is just one week away, Lord willing. We plan to be back together here at the building for uh, our uh, actually in-person worship services. And I hope you'll be able to join us either at 8.30 or at 10.30 Sunday morning. We do encourage our, our uh, older members, those who are particularly maybe see yourself at risk to come to the earlier service. But I hope that uh, you guys can join us on Sunday. And of course, I'll reiterate again we understand if uh, if you choose not to these online options are going to continue to be available we're going to continue to minister to you continue to serve you and and Lord willing it won't be long before all of us will feel will uh, be able to and feel comfortable gathering back together uh, for worship assembly. Hey, I'm in the youth room this morning and I'm here for a reason. I wanted to, to show you, if you've not seen this beautiful picture of Jesus on the cross uh, that hangs in our youth room. I believe it was in our youth office for a while, but it's just a beautiful picture. And I don't know the whole story behind it. I've got to be honest with you. Some of our young people do and they'll probably correct me. But this came from a youth of event some years ago and it was painted by a guy I think there's several guys who do this now but known as the Jesus painter and uh, uh, the Jesus painter is a fella who, uh, who who is invited to workshops seminars conferences and things and and he will set up his canvas and he will begin to tell the story of Jesus and as he does so, as he preaches the gospel, he's painting. 
And by the end of the, the lesson, he has, a he, he has painted a beautiful picture of the Messiah, sort of like uh, sort of like Bob Ross with a purpose, you know, um, and and it's and it's a beautiful remembrance then of that amazing lesson. Now I wish that I had that talent. I have always envied folks who could who could paint beautifully like that, as I've envied folks who can sing beautifully uh, like we have been so blessed uh, to have in our congregation. And thank you to the Cooley and the Osteen families for providing some songs for us the last several weeks, and to the Clarks this week for providing us a wonderful uh, way of hearing uh, worship and song. But uh, uh, I, I, I wish I have that talent I always love it when I hear of people who have found a way to tell the story of Jesus through their gifts, through their talents. And, and that's where we want to go this morning. So for the last several weeks, we have been uh, in a series I've been calling Fix Your Eyes on Jesus. And we have been, um, that's kind of been our backdrop we have been trying to draw on the experience of those in Scripture who, who encountered Jesus and whose lives were changed by Jesus, whose perspectives in life were changed by Jesus. We, we looked at Peter who, who learned to fix his eyes on Jesus and was able to walk on water. We looked at the, the story of a, a man who was born blind but then was made able to see Jesus very clearly. And then his physical sight was restored. We looked at a, a Pharisee, a man who had sight but then was made blind so that he could see Jesus more clearly for the very same reason as that blind man. Um, of course, that was Paul, also known as Saul. And we considered last week how Paul saw the various struggles that he dealt with in life, the thorn in the flesh, so to speak, and the, and the struggles that he dealt with in general as a way that God was teaching him to rely more fully on him and not on, not on Paul himself, but to rely more fully on God. Today I want to return to, um, to, to, to the book of Acts and to that first encounter that we had with Paul. But this morning, I want us to shift our focus, not, not on Paul, but on Stephen, a man by the name of Stephen. Now, maybe you recognize that name. Probably you do. He, was, he is known, of course, as the first Christian martyr, the first uh, believer to die for his faith. We don't know a whole lot about Stephen, actually. We don't know very much at all. It isn't until the sixth chapter of Acts where we get our first encounter with Stephen. And if you open up your Bibles and you look at Acts chapter 6, you kind of uh, you, you uh, uh, breeze through there. You, you're reminded that in Acts chapter 6, a problem has popped up in that infant church in Jerusalem. Apparently, there are some members who are being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. The, the Grecian Jewish widows had been neglected uh, in, in favor of the Hebraic Jews, uh, the widows of Hebraic ethnicity. With, <laughs> the apostles know that that's a problem, but they want to focus their, their attention on prayer and the ministry of the Word. And so... And so they gathered all of the disciples together and they said, all right, we're going to choose, we want you to choose seven men from among you who were known to be full of wisdom and the Spirit of God and uh, turn this responsibility over to them. That way they could give their attention to prayer in the ministry of the Word. Look at verse 5, chapter Acts 6, verse 5. It says, this proposal pleased the whole group. Now, I have to pause there and wonder, that's probably the last time this has ever been said about any church that I know of, that any one proposal made everybody happy. We know how rare that is, right? All kidding aside, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also, Philip, 
Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Par- Parmenas, Nicholas from Antioch, who was a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So what do we know of Stephen? We know Stephen was uh, a man who was full of wisdom in the Holy Spirit. That was one of the criteria for the choosing of these, serv- these, these special servants. We know here in verse 5 that he is a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And you go down a little bit further in verse 8, we see that he is a man full of God's grace and power. And so you very much get the idea that Stephen was a really strong and faithful disciple of Jesus. And that's where the problem was. That got him into trouble. Picking up in verse 9, the Bible says opposition arose from members of the synagogue of the freedman, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Well, not being able to, to argue against him, They started to slander him. That's what we do, don't we? Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, Well, we've heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and they brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fella never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs of Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Obviously, Stephen was an innocent man, Guilty only of telling others about Jesus. Guilty only of being a man full of wisdom and the Spirit of God. Now, I'm not going to take time to read all of chapter 7. But I want you to skim through there. There, Stephen is, uh, is hauled before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council the authorities, and he's got to know what is about to happen. He's got to know how this is going to go. We aren't all that far removed at this point in the story from Jesus' crucifixion. Stephen, no doubt, has got to know what is about to go down. And yet, and yet he uses it as an opportunity to tell the story of God to tell the story. Stephen knew what these men were capable of, of course, and he, prob- he had to have known what was about to happen. Nonetheless, I want you to hear some of what he said, picking up at the very beginning of chapter 7. And the high priest asked him, Are these charges true? To this Stephen replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I'll show you. And so he left the land of the Chaldeans and he settled in Haran. Now, I'm just going to stop right there, but I want you to, to skim through the rest of the chapter and I want you to see what Stephen was doing. He was telling the story of God. And as you read through, you see he leaves very little out, right? Beginning with the story of Abraham, he tells of how God called Abraham, how he formed he and his family into a a people, a nation, a holy nation, a people unto himself. He tells how God worked through Isaac and Jacob and Jacob's sons, the twelve patriarchs. He, He tells of Joseph and how the the people wound up in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. 
And then he tells of how Moses was called by God to, to go and to deliver his people up out of slavery and into freedom. Leading them into the wilderness, sustaining them, guiding them, watching them, protecting them. Stephen tells the story. And then into the promised land. The land flowing with milk and honey, the land that had been promised to them for generations, finally is theirs. And then in verse 51, his story takes a turn. And he looks at his accusers. And he says, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. And you have received the law, you who have received the law that was put into effect through angels but have not obeyed it. It It's pretty gutsy, wasn't it? Of course, his rebuke angers them. They they cover their ears, refusing to hear any more. That's what we do, isn't it? I mean, that's what we do when we hear something that, that we don't like, when we hear something that maybe doesn't fit our preconceived notions of the way things are or the way things ought to be. We, we refuse to hear it. Maybe we hit that block button on Facebook or the unfriend one. We act offended and we close our ears. That's what they did. And then they begin yelling at him. They begin yelling and screaming. They drag him out of the city to stone him. But just before they do, look at verse 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Just before they started hurling the stones at him, just before Stephen's body is is beaten to death under a pile of rocks, all through these events, Stephen's eyes remain fixed on Jesus. They're fixed on Jesus, and and I believe that. I say that because just before he dies, he looks up and he sees Jesus. He sees the glory of God in Jesus. And, and And he saw that because that's what he had been looking for all along. He saw saw Jesus. His eyes were fixed on Jesus because they had been fixed on Him from the very beginning. The word martyr has come to mean one who is killed for a cause, perhaps religious, perhaps political, maybe even social. But the word martyr itself comes from the original Greek word martus, which which just simply meant literally witness. A witness. Stephen was witnessing. He was expressing his, his testimony, if you will, of what he knew to be true about God. And he was killed for it. So technically you could say Stephen wasn't, uh, didn't become a martyr because he was killed. He was killed because he was a martyr. He was witnessing about Jesus. And he was killed for it. Now isn't that what you and I are called to be? In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus in some of His final words to His disciples said, You will be My witnesses. Here in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Stephen was doing just that. That's what Stephen was doing. He was being a witness there in Jerusalem 
telling the story of Jesus. And because his eyes were fixed on Jesus in his final moments before leaving this world, that's who he saw. He looked up and he saw Jesus. In Acts chapter, in verse 59, it says, While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed. I want you to notice the manner in which Stephen died. Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now doesn't that sound like Jesus? Forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. So one of the things that I have really grown tired of in the last several weeks is uh, this phrase, in these uncertain times. Uh, have you heard that a time or two in the last few weeks? It seems like every commercial, every ad, every email I'm getting these days starts off with that line, in these uncertain times. Well, I'm tired of hearing it. I really am. But they are difficult times, aren't they? They are uncertain. The last few weeks have been difficult for so many, and I know they've been more difficult for some than others, and, and I think probably most of us have had it relatively easy. easy. Uh, I even heard one fellow boast early on that uh, he, this was giving him the best vacation from work that he had had in a long time. Well, I think about that, and I think that that's, that's to belittle what so many have been experiencing if not here, certainly in other places. There are people out of work. There are businesses which are closed and won't be reopening. Uh, there's time lost with loved ones. And, and that's not even to mention the thousands who have gotten sick and the many who have died. I know families, personally, I know families who are struggling. I know churches that are struggling. Um, and I can tell you, our elders are doing what I believe is to be the absolute best that, that they know how to do to uh, come up with a reopening plan, a, a way for us to come back to the, to the building for worship and to do that safely and to do that responsibly. Uh, frankly, I've been surprised at some of the negative comments I've heard here and in other places even about that. Church, I think we need to be very careful about the language that we use and the attitude that, that we project and that we are demonstrating to others and to be sure that we are projecting an attitude of graciousness and understanding. There's still some difficult days ahead, I, I know. While I hope we're on the downward trend of this recent threat, I know that there are still going to be tough times, tough times for many. And that makes this message this morning all the more relevant. And I think it makes the, the example of Stephen all that more compelling to look at. It does to me. To think that despite all that was happening, despite the, the arguing that was going on in the church in Jerusalem, despite the, the hurt feelings that uh, had been experienced by some of the members there, despite being drugged before the authorities, and even despite the rocks which were being hurled at him, Stephen never stopped telling the story. He never stopped. He never stopped proclaiming Jesus to those around him. He didn't let the Sanhedrin stop him. He didn't let the authorities stop him. He didn't let the rocks stop him. He didn't even let death stop him. Because here we are 2,000 years later and we're still reading his words. Thanks to God's Spirit and the pen of the physician Luke for writing these things down. And I can't help but wonder what kind of impact Stephen must have had on those who were around him on that day. We know that one of those individuals was a Pharisee by the name of Saul, whose story we've already looked at and who we are very familiar with. 
Saul was standing there as Stephen was stoned to death, standing there over the coats of the men who were throwing the rocks. The text tells us he was giving approval to Stephen's death. But I wonder what must have been going through Paul's mind on that occasion. You, you've got to know, or you've got to think, that Saul may have been moved by seeing a man who was willing to go to his death telling the story of Jesus. It took a dramatic conversion on the road to Damascus to do it. But many years later, Paul would do the very same thing. He would go to his death in Rome, most likely, for telling the story of Jesus. So what about you? What about us? What about me? Are we telling the story? I can tell you, even though I stand before you each week, uh, these last few weeks on television screens or computer monitors, but even though I stand before you each week, uh, I can tell you I've got a lot of room for improvement. I I'm not happy with, the, the way, with my own uh, courage and certainly creativity in telling the story of Jesus outside these walls. I know that there's room for improvement. What about you? Are you happy with the way that you've told the story of Jesus through all of this? Have you found creative ways to do that? Don't we believe that He's the answer? Certainly we do. And why aren't we more excited to tell the story? So this morning, instead of looking at, at this story of Stephen and thinking, oh man, I could never do that. Or, or thinking, well, this doesn't relate to me because we're not experiencing anything like Stephen experienced. Well, that's true. But instead of that, let us look at this story and draw inspiration from his courageous example. And, and, and let us tell the story of Jesus. Be inspired to tell the story of Jesus in every way that we can. In every, using every gift that God has given us. Here, right here in Fayetteville, right here in our Jerusalem, in your home, and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for blessing us. Father, I thank you for giving us this ex wonderful example of your servant, Stephen. Father, may I look at this story and, and draw inspiration from the fact that here's a guy who, despite all that was going on around him, never stopped telling your story. Father, give me that courage. Give me that uh, inspiration. Give me that creativity. Give me that boldness. Father, I thank you for being with us through these days and as we look forward to being able to gather again real soon. Father, we pray that uh, you will continue to guide us in all wisdom, that you will continue to watch over us and keep us safe and healthy. And Father, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As I have been saying for the last several weeks, there's a number of ways to respond. that We would love to hear from you. If uh, we can pray with you, pray for you, we would love that opportunity. You can put comments down below in the, uh, in the section if you're watching this on Facebook or, or YouTube or email us, contact us directly. We would love to, to hear from you and know how that we can pray for you. Until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn His face unto you and give you peace. Have a blessed day.